cartilage, there are three types of cartilage we're going to discuss today. Uh, cartilage, in fact, is one of the most important tissues in the body. And there are three different types of uh, cartilage. There is the hyaline cartilage, elastic cartilage, and fibrocartilage. Now, each and every one of them are specific in some way or another. They have some individualities, but nonetheless, they share many, many features that are actually common. Uh, it's don't forget it's still part of the uh, it's still part of the connective tissue. We still find the same ECM that we saw, uh, uh, extra, extra matrix that we saw in the previous in the connective tissue, which is the glucosaminoglycans, multi proteins, and um, glycoproteins. So uh, let's start talking about the common things that they have first in the beginning, and then we're going to go uh, through completely one of them individu individually, one by one. So first up, the mechanical properties of all types of cartilages are, are uh, actually uh, given by the potential and the specific characteristics of the glucosaminoglycans and protoglycans. Meaning what? Last time we discussed about agrican. We saw how agrican had this shape that was a tree-like shape, similar to this in fact. It was exactly like this. And we saw that the, there was a core axis, the core protein, and the uh, different, the core, sorry, uh, the hyaluronic axis. On top of that, there were the core proteins. And on top of that, we had the uh, specific uh, glucosaminoglycans on top. The point is that this structure enabled, enables uh, water and growth factors to be practically entrapped within these spaces right here in between these, uh, these proteins and in between the glucosaminoglycans. And the thing is, the, the result of this aggregation of water is what gives the a cartilage its elastic and resilient properties. Imagine like a balloon simply filled with water. The, the, in, because of its uh, water content, it's allowed to be more malleable, more flexible, and more resistant, more resistant to many different types of indirection of forces. This is exactly how the mechanical properties of cartilage are actually achieved through simply entrapment of water. This is one of the common features that they have. The second thing that the second mechanical uh, property is of course again there is a result of the high water content is because uh, it's uh, the distortion that this the cartilage elastic cartilage or hyaline cartilage are not uh, are able to practically resist uh, um, resist mechanical forces resist tension and uh, go back to its original shape as it was in the beginning. One typical example is the, the elastic cartilage of the ear. And specifically, the ear that has this, this capacity to practically go back to its original size and shape after distortion. This is very, very important. Uh, based on the location of the cartilage, we'll discuss that we have different types of cartilage and different locations of cartilage throughout the whole body. And based on the uh, location, we've also known, for example, that in the ribs we have cartilage. Specifically, we have hyaline cartilage there. We'll discuss what it is specifically. But the function of the hyaline cartilage typically is to, to and fibrocartilage is to absorb uh, shock. Meaning what? Meaning that it's uh, able to practically minimize the damage that it can, that a uh, specific location can receive. And typically we find it in the joints, typically we find it in the in all actually the joints of the long bones and in many other different areas in the body. Another example is in the ribs, hyaline cartilage and so on and so on. So to sum up, we have common mechanical properties of cartilage that, it, that are specific as such. Are resistant to distortion, they do not distort permanently, meaning that they will return to its original shape and size of course in logical in a logical range not infinitely there is some uh, fracture point at, after some uh, excessive amount of force that's number one so they can there isn't they're resistant to distortion they are also uh, because of their high water content they're also more uh, flexible let's call them of course other factors come into play in this flexibility or in this uh, let's say this unique mechanical properties but one of them of course is the high amount of water found in, within this and of course they are because of this the potential to uh, practically f function as a water balloon let's call it they're able to absorb shock and minimize the damage that the long bone or either any other vital structure can and will receive so again uh, we should discuss something the, again this there are some common 
characteristics dot r uh, that affects directly both the function and the potential of uh, the cartilage. First of all, one very important feature is that it's avascular, same as the epithelial tissue. Do you remember what I told you? What is the result of avascular? How does how do how does the cell of the cartilage tissue practically survive with no vessels? Guys, what do you think? From the underlying connective tissue. Sure, but how does it receive the nutrients? What is the what, through what? Diffusion. Exactly, precisely through diffusion, and what is the what's the problem with diffusion? I mean, diffusion is a uh, very distance. distance, precisely because diffusion has limitations when it comes to the distance, the thickness, and the volume of a structure, meaning that uh, one cell cannot survive um, when it's when it has a, a specific a bigger distance than the potential of the of the diffusion. After once after one part and on this cell will not receive after one distance one specific distance from uh, the vascular or the vessel to the uh, cell after some distance the cell will not be able to receive any nutrients any oxygen and, and in the end die from ischemia from loss from absence of blood and oxygen meaning that this has as a limitation it limits the uh, size of the of all the structures that are vascular we saw in the epithelial as well epithelial structures are not very very thick with the exception of the skin but even in the skin we see that when there is a big distance from the vessel the uh, upper the upper structures are dead are necrotic so this tells us and this practically puts a size limitation to cartilage cartilage cannot be excessively thick simply because after one distance after one specific uh, some millimeters let's call them i don't know exactly the, the numbers but after some distance these cells will not receive perfusion and will die that's why it, it is vital for the structure that it maintains a specific thickness just as enough to receive perfect oxygenation and nutrients from all the different uh, vessels that surround it now there are some specific cells that we find in the cartilage. What are the cells that actually make up the cartilage? These are the chondroblasts and chondrocytes. We'll discuss them in detail. But this, they also, the, all of the cartilages, all three types of cartilages, have exactly the same cells. So, so far, we have found that all of the types of different types of cartilages have chondroblasts and chondrocytes. We'll discuss about these cells and have many 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 common features in the ECM in fact they're almost identical there there are minor differences when it comes to different types of collagen fiber or presence or absence of elastic fibers but nonetheless the glucosaminoglycans high concentration of glucosaminoglycans of protoglycans and connect and multi adhesive glycoproteins are a common thing amongst all three types and lastly they all share a perichondrium perichondrium is a very very important structure vital to the existence and maintenance of the cartilage in fact the perichondrium is responsible both for the thickness for the how thick this uh, cartilage is and how long it is we'll discuss how the perichondrium affects this but the perichondrium is a structure that is responsible for the production and the generation of chondroblasts and chondrocytes we'll go into detail so let's start focusing specifically to all the different types of cartilages and discuss their individual features and characteristics. There is, as I said again before, there are three types, hyaline, elastic and fibrocartilage. It is important to understand that because they are different, they serve different, uh, because they are different of core cartilages, they in, they're located in different locations in order to better serve the function and the necessity of each specific site. For example, Elastic cartilage, the property of elastic cartilage is that it's simply way more resistant to distortion. It will go back to its original size and original shape and don't not receive permanent destruction or permanent distortion of the structure. Of course, there are some structures in our body that require to maintain their shape and the size and most importantly, the location. For example, we have the cartilage in the ear. This is, we all know it, we'll see it, we can all experience the elasticity and the capacity of the ear to practically go back to its original uh, location and, uh, and uh, uh, size and shape, sorry. And, but way more importantly is the elastic cartilage of the epiglottis. What is the function of epiglottis, guys? To prevent 
food uh, food impaction on the respiratory system. So the epiglottis practically covers completely the respiratory tube, the, specifically the, uh, larynx and the, the larynx and the trachea, covers it completely whenever food, food passes through. But it's absolutely vital and necessary that it goes back to its original location, original inclination for us to allow, to allow breathing. So, of course, this is one of the most important features of elastic cartilage and one of the most important examples of elastic cartilage. This is the first one, the easiest one, and the one that we practically have seen and touched and are more familiar with. Then we go to the most common, actually, cartilage in the human body, hyaline cartilage. Hyaline cartilage is, is in fact, one of the more, most resilient uh, type of cartilages in our body. It, it can actually manage and receive more stress and is more uh, resistant to, uh, to any mechanical changes. Most importantly, stress mechanical, stress-related mechanical uh, uh, tensions and forces. We have numerous, numerous sites in our body have hyaline cartilage. One of the most common one is the ribs. All of the part of the ribs, all the inner ribs practically, are filled with cartilage, with hyaline cartilage. And another very, very important location is in the end of long bones. In the end of long bones, we can always find this hyaline cartilage covering up the epiphysis, the finishing of the bones, in order to prevent friction from destroying the two different uh, bones coming into contact. And lastly, we have the fibrocartilage. Fibrocartilage is, let's say, something more of a connecting point of different, uh, or different, uh, different, sorry, uh, let's say, compartments of bones. In the most, the most, very most common and most important example of the uh, fibrocartilage are the intervertebral discs. We'll discuss it specifically what it is. And another side is the pubic symphysis. The pubic symphysis also is made out of fibrocartilage. So, if you look at this picture, we can simply clearly see hyaline cartilage. This is the perfect example of the articular cartilage. Any cartilage that's on the, in the edge, in the edges and covering the long bones is called articular cartilage. I'm sure you know this already from anatomy. One important feature is the color. What is the color of cartilage right here? What do you think is this color? Why is it white? Why? What's, what's up? There is no blood. It's a completely a vascular structure. There is no presence of red. It's simply a arc, like there is no coloration inside it. The only color that it contains is maybe sometimes a yellowish hue, maybe, and this is depending on the location, depending on the age of this person. And this is, of course, based on the uh, amount of glucosaminoglycans and ECM that is inside the hyaline cartilage. So, we already discussed the locations or where we can find the uh, hyaline cartilage. I'm sure you already know this from anatomy so far. The, what is the diaphysis, what is the metaphysis, and what is the epiphysis? So, of course, always the, cartilage, the hyaline cartilage is found in the, art, the articular uh, surfaces and in the, in the, uh, practically in the epiphysial uh, end, the epiphysial ends of long bones. And this, of course, the function is to prevent friction and destruction of the bone from, uh, because once we have movement, once we have two long two uh, muscles moving, and of and as a natural result, we have two. We would have, without the uh, presence of cartilage, we would have two bones, two very very rough and very very uh, strong structures, con continuously producing friction with one another and end up in destruction and uh, mechanical death. Whenever this is a golden rule of generally of cells and medicine, in fact. Whenever you have a continuous pressure or a repeated mechanical irritation of a cell or of a structure, you will have the necrosis, the death of this site. Always remember this. So let's talk a bit about what is the, what makes hyaline cartilage so much different, a bit a bit more different than the other types of cartilage. Specifically, we already discussed that it has the glucose, the ECMs. These, all of these are the ECM parts. They move the adhesive glycoproteins, protoglycans, and glucosaminoglycans, of course. And they're also here. It should be here. Very, very important feature is the collagen. Collagen does. What's the function of collagen? The function of collagen is that it, uh, based on its orientation, based on its presence, and based on its density, it can provide the mechanical properties of this tissue. Specifically, here in hyaline cartilage, we have, <clears throat> we have uh, uh, high amounts of, co of collagen inside it. 
inside of it. And most importantly, the biggest, the biggest component, the biggest percentage of uh, the components of the ingredients, let's call it of Highland Cardulous, is water. And this is why, uh, the, this is why we have this resistance, this mechanical resistance. One of the reasons why, actually, not the one of the reasons why it has such unique mechanical capacity is because of its high presence of water. Here we see one very important name, chondronectin. Chondronectin is a multi-adhesive glycoprotein. What is the function of, of multi-adhesive glycoproteins, guys? The multi-adhesive glycoprotein, as the name suggests, is the function of adhesion, the function of connecting one structure with another. Specifically, the very important function is that it connects cells to the ECM. It is the structure that anchors and holds and, and practically induces the uh, specific presence of one cell to the ECM. If we did not have the multi-adhesive glycoproteins, in this case, it's the chondronectin. Chondro comes from the word uh, jo uh, cartilage, and nectin is from the word to connect, to practically to connect to structures. And chondronectin is one of the most important glycoproteins, multi-adhesive glycoproteins in the structure. And again, the function of a glyco of multi-adhesive glycoprotein is to, to orchestrate and to instruct where the cell should adhere and what structure can be glued from one to the other. It practically orchestrates and is the director of all of the ECM and it's in the relationship of the ECM to the cells. And of course, different parts of ECM with itself. For example, protoglycans sometimes can connect with, through the, to the glucosaminoglycans through glycoproteins. Long story short, glyco, multi adhesive glycoproteins serve the function to orchestrate and to instruct where each cell is going to connect to what part of the ECM, to what protein of the ECM is going, or carbohydrate is going to be connected to. So that's the very important function of multi-adhesive glycoprotein. And here specifically we have chondronectin. This is a name I want you to remember because you'll see again similar features. You'll see in the bone, not exactly chondronectin, but you'll see again the similar logic and the similar structure of the multi-adhesive glycoproteins. So this is the, we discussed this scheme last time and actually right now in the introduction. Uh, this is one of the most important structures. This is agrican. This is uh, here we find the connection of how agrican is actually incorporated inside and located practically fused within the ECM and the collagen. Specifically here we have collagen type 2. So in this case we see how the agrican, which is the structure responsible for the aggregation of water and the aggregation of growth factors within this structure, so how agrican connects with the type 2 collagen and practically uh, assures and re reassures and, right, and establishes its position within the ECM of the cartilage. As I was saying, this is the complete picture of what we see. Here we see the perfect, the perfect graphic presentation of how the ECM is connected with the cells through, of course, multi-adhesive glycoproteins. Here we see all three parts of the ECM and the fibers, of course. We see all of the ECM connecting perfectly to the cells, specifically the chondrocytes. Again, chondro means joint. So the joints, the cells of the joint, the cartilage, sorry, not joint, sorry, cartilage. Sorry, I'm sorry. Chondro means cartilage. So we see the cells of the cartilage being attached to the ECM. We see this mixture of collagen type 2 along with the glue with agrican again these these tree like structures of the agrican how the gluco the structures of the glucosaminoglycans how agrican specifically connects both the collagen and the cells this is how we have this specific orientation and we'll see exactly what it means how specific this orientation is we'll see the structure in the in the, in the microscope in just one second but you'll see that the locations and the organization and the numbers and the every part of its location, size, uh, uh, large volume, all of its properties are tightly and very, very neatly controlled. And this is because of this, this capacity of the ECM 
to very masterfully, comp uh, masterfully connect and make specific complexes with the chondrocytes. So, here, we're going to start seeing an example of the hyaline cartilage specifically. This structure is the trachea. We saw that uh, the hyaline cartilage is present, of course, in the articular cartilage, in the end of the joints. But one very important thing is that it, it practically structures the whole respiratory system. The question is, why do we need such a hard structure? Because cartilage is hard, not like bone hard, but it's actually quite a resilient structure. Why would we need cartilage, such as hard structure, within the respiratory system, guys? To maintain the diameter, the diameter of the trachea should be specific and not changing that easily. So, in fact, here we'll find two different features of how the trachea is also able to maintain the diameter big enough so air can always pass through. This is a vital function of the human body. But also it should be, uh, let's say, malleable and flexible enough to shrink in diameter, not massively, not close, again, to keep this part of the diameter big enough for air to go in, but also flexible enough so that water, so that, sorry, uh, water or uh, food or any sort of uh, content that passes through the esophagus is able to dilate and practically allow the food to go from the mouth to the stomach. So here we find two different features. Here again, we find two sections. What is this section? What is this section? No, look, 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 look. This is the tube. Imagine that this tube is the trachea, all right? And let me also go back to the picture. So this is the trachea as it is. If I cut, the cross means this. This is the longitudinal. If I cut it in a long axis, like in this, and I open it up and I slice it out, I will see the many different layer circles of cartilage. Because the trachea, I'm sure maybe you've seen from already in anatomy, because in the human body anatomy, you saw how the trachea looks like. And you saw that there are many ring-like uh, rings, lit not ring-like, literally rings of uh, cartilage. So we have many, many bands and belts and rings of uh, cartilage. So if I have a, a cartilage in this manner, in this circle, and I cut it in the long section, I will see many, many of these rings laid out and continuously one another like in the single proper sequence when i have the cross the cross section i will only see the one ring of cartilage which is in the cross section so to sum up the lower one this is the cross section and this is the long section so this this layer this upper layer that's full of card this, this is full of type 1 collagen this is part of the perichondrium the perichondrium has two different layers. The upper one is the uh, partum, the stratum uh, fibrosum, or the fibrous layer, whatever you prefer to call it, which is practically nothing more than just an accumulation of fibroblasts and collagen type 1, the upper one. And the lower one, the most important one of the perichondrium, is the stratum chondrogenicum, or the chondrogenic layer. Meaning what? It's the layer that is responsible for the production of the chondroblasts and chondrocytes. So chondroblasts are the cells of the cartilage. Specifically, we see that these cells are responsible for the production of ECM. Chondroblasts are the cells that not only produce the ECM, produce of course uh, and all the, all the contents of ECM. That means collagen fibers, that can mean in some structures, in the elastic cartilage, also elastic fibers, they can produce glucosaminoglycans, protoglycans, multi glycoproteins. So the stratum chondrogenicum is practically filled with uh, free, uh, with mesenchymal-like cells. We have the prechondroblastic cells. So here, these mesenchymal stem cells are, are able to differentiate and to progress deep into deeper portions and practically give rise to the chondroblasts. So, in this case, we start seeing the upper layer, this layer right here, this is the stratum uh, chondrogenicum, the chondrogenic layer. 
and starting from this point on when we start seeing these mesenchymal cells become larger they become larger and they have a bigger area open inside the uh, the cytoplasm this whenever they thicken let's say and they more come this become this uh, type of uh, cells they start to differentiate and they can now be called chondroblasts so the moment they start to progress from the outer part of the cartilage imagine this is the cartilage the perichondrium is on top so the chondro, uh, chondrogenic layer is the cell that is the layer that provides the mesenchymal stem cells and these mesenchymal stem cells progress and go through two uh, deeper portions of the cartilage to give rise to the chondroblasts now the chondroblasts will start to mitotically divide and uh, produce uh, this called this so-called isogenous groups the thing is that these uh, whenever we have only one chondroblast that starts from the perichondrium and starts moving towards the center of the uh, cartilage this will start to mitotically divide the moment a cell is able to mitotically divide is called a chondroblast which means the chondroblast will start dividing, mitotically dividing, and give rise to from two up to eight different chondrocytes. Isogenus. Genus means species, but why would they call it this of the same species? This is practically group. The, the literal translation of this term is the uh, the group of the same species. Why do you think that is? It's because that one chondroblast will divide mitotically to give rise to eight so whenever to eight chondrocytes the chondrocyte is the uh, differentiated uh, chondroblast the chondroblast has the potential to uh, mitotically divide and differentiate and the chondrocyte has also the potential to, dif to uh, mitotically divide but not differentiate this is the full uh, the, the last stage of differentiation so the chondroblast in the end is going to give rise uh, to this isogenous group and it's called isogenous group because the, they have the, all of these cells up to eight cells in the hyaline cartilage these eight cells have exactly the same uh, parent cell the same, exactly the same chondro, par, chondroblast that's why it's called isogenous group isogenous aggregate so let's go back to the picture let's let's go through the whole journey we have the osteogenic layer. The, here they have the pre uh, pre chondroblast. The chondroblast is like here we have the full uh, the fully matured chondroblast. And the moment it starts growing going into deeper portions, it starts to mitotically divide. For example, here we have a very nice isogenous group of four one two three four specific chondrocytes. After the first step of mitotic division, when we, the moment we have the first mitotic division of the chondroblast, uh, of the chondroblast, that moment, this and the, this, the first mitotic division also coincides with the differentiation of this cell. So, the first after this this division, this chondroblast becomes the chondrocyte. Not only because it mitotically divides, but also because it differentiates into the chondrocyte. The chondrocytes still have the potential to mitotically divide not to differentiate nonetheless so these two chondrocytes will either keep on um, mitotically dividing and reach up to eight uh, cells into one group into one location and the location that one of these chondrocytes are actually uh, inside this this look this uh, uh, place it's called lacuna okay so the lacuna we have all of each of the specific chondrocytes is located within one lacuna so uh, the distinctive feature is that the isogenous groups of the hyaline cartilage can reach up to eight cells so this is the part the first part that we care about the second that I wanted to show you is the this is the back part now this is the trachea okay this cube is the trachea in the anterior part we have the cartilages all right in the posterior part that is esophagus is right here trachea in the uh, trachea is right here so the anterior part has the hyaline cartilage and the posterior part has what has the trachealis muscle this is a muscle what type of muscle do you think it is these are smooth muscles the question is why would we have a smooth muscle in the back of the trachea the structure the logic is here that this muscle 
is the one that controls the diameter of the trachea because the anterior part is hard rigid we have the cartilage inside of it and there is no potential for size adjustment the trachealis muscle in the posterior allows our human our body to control the diameter of the trachea whether it's enlarged or whether it's uh, or not this is uh, that's the normal function of the trachealis muscle trachealis muscle to, uh, to control the diameter of the trachea this is important for of course eating for anything and like to allow the esophagus to be able to distend and increase the diameter so food and water can go through it easily without uh, any other of any other complication let's call it but this is the normal this is the the healthy as it should be now let's take it a, a bit a, a, a step further let's think about a pathological function when we have an anaphylactic shock we discussed last time in the connective tissue about mast cells and we discussed about the histamine and the function of histamine was what what was the function of histamine function of histamine is dual first we have vasodilation of the uh, of the capillaries of the vessels that are close to the skin that's why when we have allergies we have this hives these red spots in our in our skin it's because we have the vasodilation of the vessels number one and second and most importantly they induce the constriction of smooth muscles this actually what i'm saying right now can actually help you save a life this is something too important too important to ignore histamine induces the con the contraction of smooth muscles this is why when we have excessive amounts of histamine in the human body and we have the allergic shock this is why we, we give we should absolutely treat this anaphylactic shock immediately simply because as the trachea is as structure as it is these muscles of the uh, the smooth muscles the trachealis muscles all of these trachealis muscles because of the high amount of, of the histamine start to contract excessively and because of this excess contraction the diameter of the trachea constricts into tiny and many times can fully completely should be shut completely closed because of this excessive constriction of the smooth muscles and of course the moment you recognize that someone is having anaphylactic shock you immediately treat him with adrenaline so let's see this uh this smooth, smooth muscles so again on top we have the epithelial this this uh, respiratory epithelium exactly beneath we have the connective tissue first loose then dense and here we have the bands of the muscles we'll discuss how we can differentiate the fibroblast from the muscle uh, but at this and, and uh, at this point the simple thing to say is that the shape of the fibroblast sorry where are you the shape of the fibroblast is, is I mean, the fibrocyte is more uh, let's say this shape more triagonally uh, less the, the fibroblast is triagonally shaped and the fibrocyte is more, let's say, uh, oval, ovalish, let's call it, leaf-like structure of the nucleus. The, because of the, the differences, how to differentiate the, for the smooth muscle from the fibroblast is the uh, S-shaped, look S-shaped uh, nucleus, the nucleus. Because of this, this cell, the smooth muscle cells, the function of smooth muscle is, of course, contraction. So whenever a cell contracts, the whole architecture of the cell changes and this is a perfect picture to see exactly this perfect example do you see this uh, s-shaped nuclei this let's say uh, wavy appearance of this nucleus this is how we can be 100 percent sure that this cell is a smooth muscle we'll discuss it of course extensively in the chapter in the muscle but just right now for you to be able to differentiate where the trachealis muscle is this is where you can find it based on the uh, waviness of the uh, nuclei so let's move on there are two things we should discuss about the uh, esophagus groups in the, the mat there is the territorial matrix and the extraterritorial matrix these uh, are locations of the uh, that are in uh, the, that are produced practically uh, through the with the uh, chondrocytes the territorial matrix is the content between 
these sojourners groups between these chondrocytes because we have again in one like in the lacunae we have many different chondrocytes and the, the, there's some some content some material some part of ECM within this lacunae this structure that is within the lacunae is called territorial matrix and this ECM that is located between two different uh, chondro uh, groups two different groups this is the extraterritorial matrix for example in this picture this dark circle that surrounds this chondrocyte this is the territorial matrix this structure this purplish structure that is from the one lacuna to the other lacuna from one group to the other group this structure right here is called the extra territorial uh, matrix pericondrium we discussed about the pericondrium and the two layers we just also saw these pictures as it is this is just the same picture that we saw before, but in a graphic representation. Guys, want to take a break of uh, 10 minutes and come back to it? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah, sure. Lovely.